about uh, what this meeting is fundamentally all about, which is uh, one of the uh, most powerful business transformations in the process that I've ever even studied, much less experienced. Uh, this idea that uh, products are changing in a fundamental way. Now, in, in order to understand uh, what we're all here to talk about today, I think we have to have a little bit of historical perspective on how information technology has been over decades and decades really permeating companies and permeating competition. And if we go back far enough, of course, there was no information technology. Products were mechanical and electrical. Processes were human, manual. Data sat in files. And that wasn't all that long ago in the scope of history. But then, uh, starting about you know, 30 or 40 years ago, information technology started to permeate the value chain how companies operate. And it started to enable the first wave of transformation, which was really automating the processes within the company. Automating order processing, automating billing, automating CAD. That was what Pro Engineer was all about. Uh, and many, many other areas. And that took quite a long time to play itself through uh, the economy, and it drove a lot of productivity growth. But then, along the way, the next wave took over, and that was really driven by connectivity and the internet. Uh, the ability to kind of connect information and processes, not only within the company, but also with outside partners, with suppliers, with the customer. And we had another wave of transformation. Supply chain management, customer relationship management, product lifecycle management. The ability of engineers on multiple continents to co-design products together in a collaborative way. That was all enabled in the second wave of transformation. And once again, productivity grew in the economy. Now we're focusing on and seeing something very, very different, which is for the first time uh, at any scale, the information technology is now not just inside the company, but it's actually embedding itself in the product itself. And what that's doing is it's, of course, dramatically changing the functionality of the product, indeed, what a product really is, what it means. But also, the product change is feeding back and changing how companies operate again. So we're going through another internal uh, transformation. And it's this last transformation that we're here to talk about today uh, it, it started getting talked about as the internet of things. But I think the internet part is not what's really unique here. It's the things part. It's what things can do. It's what we know about what those things are actually doing. Uh, that's the big deal here. And that's why in the work Jim and I have done on this phenomenon, well, we use the phrase smart connected products to describe this phenomenon with the understanding that the internet is a key part of that, but ultimately it's not the core. The core is the products, the core is the data, the core is what the products can do, uh, and uh, that's what we're here to talk about today. We published an article, the first article on this, in November of last year in the Harvard Business Review. We hope all of you have looked at that. That really focuses on the external implications of this. How does it affect products? How does it affect competition? How does it affect industry, industry boundaries? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that again this morning, but uh, we have another article in process which we hope to, we will appear in September, again in the Harvard Business Review, which really focuses on the internal implications of this. What we're finding is that how we run a company is going to change very dramatically here, much more dramatically than in the previous generations of IT. And how we organize ourselves as companies is going to be changing because of the impact of smart connected products on uh, the nature of work, on the nature of what companies have to do and, and get done uh, in the organization. So let me just spend a minute kind of reminding, uh, getting us all on the same page in terms of what this smart connected products phenomenon really means in terms of the products themselves and what they can do. 
And then I'll hand it over to Jim, and we'll talk a little bit about how the technology that enables all that uh, 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 gets put together, uh, and, and we'll go from there. Now, as we think about uh, smart connected products, uh, uh, we uh, like to think about really four fundamental changes in the functionality of the product. What these products allow us to do. And of course, the thing that's very, very clear and we all talk about is uh, it, we, we all of a sudden we can monitor and measure what's happening to the product in a very deep way. Uh, that's what we call monitoring. And it's all, it's all those sensors, but it's also the ability to marry the internal data that we're measuring about the product or the product's function with external data that we can, when we put those two together, we get magic. And we'll be talking about that. So at the core, we have monitoring. The ability to actually know what's going on with the product in 24-7 all the time with enormous granularity. We've never had that before. That's step one. Step two is we can now separate the actual control of a product from the physical product itself. We can control a product remotely, uh, and that allows us again to do a whole lot of different things that we couldn't do when we had to have an operator sitting there uh, pulling switches and, and, and twisting dials in order to uh, uh, actually operate a product. Uh, and that leads to a whole lot of implications in terms of maintenance, in terms of operation, in terms of remote uh, maintenance, dealing with hazardous environments, it goes on and on and on. So that's number two. Number three, we can optimize performance in a new way that we've never been able to optimize before. Uh, we can optimize uh, uh, the uh, utilization of a product, we can optimize uh, the servicing of a product, when we actually service it. Uh, we can service it remotely now rather than physically. The possibilities are still beyond our ability to see them. There's so many out there. And we're inventing them and discovering them all the time. And finally, we have the opportunity for autonomy. If we have all this data, if we can monitor everything about the product and also the environment around the product, if we can control it remotely, if we can build algorithms that allow us to optimize all kinds of dimensions of how that product performs, then of course we're very short steps away from the ability to have that product operate in and of itself. Whether it's a simple application like the Roomba, you know, bouncing around the room, putting the floor, or whether it's uh, an automated plane or an automated car or all kinds of uh, autonomous operation. And, and of course, at the end of this long journey will be machine learning and products that actually are continuously deciding what they should do. So this is, this is, these are the capabilities that are now being created in products that we've never had before. And the question is, what is the technology that enables these capabilities to be uh, harnessed and, and operated, uh, and then what are their implications? So let me turn it over to Jim to talk about uh, that technology uh, underpinning in infrastructure. Great, thank you, Michael. So uh, we published this diagram in the uh, first article, and I think it's a you know, simple but pretty good way to understand how the DNA of products is changing. You might remember this morning I said they're part physical and part digital. They're part client and part server. They're part on-premise and part in the cloud all at the same time. And that's because they have a technology stack now that really includes all those elements. If we start in the middle at the bottom, you know, we start with the thing that sits in front of you. It's made of hardware and probably of software. It's tangible, you can touch it, it's on-premise with you. But then it has a communications capability, which could be through wires or radio signals or cellular signals or what have you, uh, that allows it to communicate up to a cloud. And in the cloud, we have a lot of software. And this is part of the product now. So we have, first of all, a database that gathers all of, this, uh, all of these sensor readings and aggregates the sensor readings from many different products together. This is not a typical relational database like we all grew up with. This is a big data database because this data is high volume, it's unstructured, and it's coming in extremely fast. So we need a new kind of database technology to store this data. You might remember uh, Russ Fidel talking about the data stacks 
Cassandra uh, Apache technology being an example. Now, we're gonna wanna build applications on this new data source, and not just one of them, but many of them. Russ also talked about how there could be millions of new applications created. So we're probably gonna want some reusable plumbing. We're gonna want a platform so we can build many applications and focus more on the applications and less on the infrastructure under those applications. Now, as we build those applications, we're going to want to use uh, sensor data and, and product data in general. The problem is the sensor data doesn't always tell us the full picture, so we're gonna need analytics. And sometimes it can be uh, you know, rule-based, uh, what I call little data analytics. For example, if the oil temperature is uh, too high, then you have a problem with the engine, pretty obvious. But sometimes it's the big data analytics that are doing uh, uh, analytics and prediction, saying that I see a pattern of sensor readings that I've seen before, and usually when I see that pattern of sensor readings, we have a problem, so I'm gonna alert you to the fact that I think there's a problem coming, so you can intervene and take action. And then on top of that, we're gonna build actual user interfaces, like you also saw this morning, that deliver dashboards and alerts and provide uh, work instructions and so forth to all the different people in that value chain who need to engage uh, with this thing in some form. Now, these applications don't really stand alone and only talk to products. They have to talk to other systems. They need to talk to business systems, you know, look in your customer relationship management system to see who owns this product and what are their service and warranty entitlements and maybe look in a weather forecasting system out on the internet from the government or, or from somebody else to figure out what are the weather conditions there and use satellite systems for geopositioning and, and so forth. So we're gonna need to blend together data from many different sources as part of these applications and as part of the analytics as well. And then finally, because these smart connected products now look and act like a computer of sorts, they're now vulnerable to all the problems, all the malware that you get when you connect computers to the internet. So you have to worry about all the different threats at every different level of this product and how to secure that because, as I'll talk in a minute, there's actually a, a pretty high standard of care required for the security of smart connected products. So that's the technology stack. Like I said, part digital, part physical, part client, part server, you know, part on-premise, part cloud, all at the same time, that is this new reality. These things are not distinct and separate anymore. They're forever going forward, merged together in this type of an architecture. Now I mentioned the data several times. Particularly in our second paper, what we've done is say follow the data. There's lots of information moving back and forth, particularly inbound for the products. Let's watch where that goes. And you run into some interesting ideas. Many companies have implemented the concept of a data lake, which is like a massive data warehouse, but without structure. So you're combining data from external sources and data from business systems with these massive streams of data coming in from smart connected products. And it really is the streams of data that lead to the concept of a lake. And the data stored in the, in, in the lake is not normalized and cleaned up it's stored in whatever format it's streamed in at. And against that, that whole massive collection of data, we're going to want to run analytics. Again, we need a translator to help us understand what those smart connected products are telling us. And we're gonna ask that translator sometimes to go analyze a bunch of historical data, you know, in a batch process. But more and more, we're gonna ask the translator to do real-time processing listen to the data as it comes in and alert me in real time as to what trends are developing so that I can intervene you know, before I get around to running the next batch, next batch analysis. Now there's a couple of different kinds of analytics we're gonna wanna do here. Uh, you know, we can start at the top with descriptive analytics. So descriptive analytics would say, what is that product telling me? Help, help me understand that. A little bit more sophisticated, sophisticated would be diagnostic analytics. What's going on? What is the root cause here that's causing the product to behave that way? I could get slightly more sophisticated and move into predictive analytics, which is really what we were talking about this morning. Predictive analytics would say what's going to happen next 
And then finally, if I'm really sophisticated, I could move into prescriptive analytics, which are analytics that tell me what to do to prevent what's going to happen next from actually happening so that this product remains healthy, operational, value-creating uh, thing out there in the Internet of Things. So naturally, as we uh, move down that stack, it gets increasingly difficult to get this value, but increasingly more power and value if we can. So this data really, uh, you're going to see in the rest of our talk, becomes very, very critical to how companies operate going forward. Now, I mentioned that the standard of care is quite high. And that's around the, the, the security topic, because there are many uh, you know, hackers and bad guys out there you know, who'd like to break in. And there's some real reasons that you need to, to, to worry about this. So uh, first of all, there's more at stake. If somebody hacks into an automobile driving down the road, they can do some pretty serious damage pretty quickly, much more so than by breaking into your email server or your CRM system. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a place we gotta be very careful. The second thing is that, in many ways, you could argue this is easier to attack um, because there are many different endpoints out there, all contributing uh, information and knowledge and we need to leave a door open for them. And then finally, uh, this type of a system is actually harder to defend. You can't lock it up in a physical containment like you do in a data center. It's, uh, it's too many you know, computers, they're not really computers or things, but too many things out there on the internet spread all over the world in all kinds of different environments, very few of them actually being secure. There's a second problem related to defense, which is that uh, many of these things don't have the processing power to use the type of you know, antivirus and security approaches that we would use in our data center. Some of those type of approaches are themselves quite powerful software applications, and a lot of these edge devices, the things, the smart connected products, really don't have the processing power to run all that software. So, Therefore, we have a, a vulnerability in that dimension as well. So I said the standard of care is high. There's a lot at stake. It's easier to attack and it's harder to defend. So should we just give up? You know, my view is no. You know, we'll solve this problem in the same ugly, messy way that we've solved all the other computer security problems. It's not, a, it's not an event where we secure this thing. It's an ongoing process where we keep improving our security responses and the bad guys keep improving their attack methodologies, which requires us to improve our security responses and, and vice versa. I often tell people, do you think that computers or data centers are more secure today than they were 10 years ago, despite a massive industry of information technology security? Personally, I'd argue, no, they're not more secure. So this is a, this is a big challenge, but we'll fight this challenge just like we've been fighting this challenge in the data center, and we'll beat it back over time into a level of submission that we can live with, but it'll never quite completely go away. So let me turn it over to Michael, and he'll talk about how this data really has a big impact on the value chain. Thanks, Jim. Uh, let me go back here. So the question then is, given these products and their capability and functionality, uh, and given the technology stack uh, and the data that is uh, necessary and being generated, how does this change what companies do internally? Uh, and the way we think about that is, is using the value chain. You know, what do companies do? Companies conduct a lot of business activities continuously to create and deliver value to their customers. And the value chain is simply a very simple way of sort of organizing that set of activities. Manufacturing activities, service activities, technology development activities, and so on. And so if we're going to understand how smart connected products are going to change what companies do, we've got to think about uh, how these capabilities and technology stack really play themselves through the value chain. Uh, and that's really been the, the deep focus of this new article that we're working on, actually, as we speak. Uh, the question is, how is the value chain different? Is this just something we graft on to a normal manufacturing company that kind of still looks like and does pretty much what it does in the past, or is this something different? 
And the answer is, it turns out, in, in ways that, frankly, we didn't understand uh, you know, even a year ago, uh, this is actually going to change a lot about how we do our work inside the company. Um, and it starts, of course, with the data. Uh, we need a whole new part of the value chain we never really had before, which is we need to place an organization to aggregate all this data. And those organizations are starting to be built today because it just doesn't make sense for all the little parts of the firm to kind of keep the data that's relevant to their part. There's a lake here of data, as Jim said. It's streaming it all the time. Uh, and the ability to store it and uh, aggregate it and pull together data from all different parts of, uh, of the data streams and manage that over time, that is a new function. And we're going to see a lot of entirely new groups created in many companies to, to perform this function. Uh, and we're going to see a lot of chief data officers. This is the latest C, the chief data officer, uh, the, the CDO. Uh, uh, we're going to see those in many companies because the data turns out to be, in, in a sense, the, the most unique and scarcest resource that allows one to get all the benefits of this new set of technological possibilities. Now, if we go and look at the conventional activities that we're used to thinking about, um, let's talk about them very briefly. And, and, and of course, we make, we'll make these slides available to you, and we won't be able to cover all these points today. But let's take technology development. How's that change? Well, clearly, the complexity of technology development explodes because all of a sudden, we're developing a lot more things when we develop a product. It's not just a mechanical logic anymore, or electrical logic anymore. Um, and it's got all this stuff that's inside the product, but it's all this stuff that's outside the product. So how do we pull that together? It's a complex process. It's a systems engineering problem, not a mechanical engineering problem, not an electrical engineering problem. Um, uh, we require... Um, enormous now collaboration between IT and R&D. Those groups have historically been largely sim uh, separate, uh, largely doing their own things. Now we have to fuse those in some very powerful new ways. Uh, because we have all this usage data, since we know everything about the product all the time, the feedback loop in design and engineering gets dramatically shorter. And indeed, it can be real time. We can be, we can be, and, and that leads to some other key design concepts that most companies haven't really confronted yet. Right? We don't really know how to do this. You know, how do we design products where product design is not an episodic process where we do a big release and then we're done and move on to the next one? How is product design a continuous process? How do we kind of continuously improve the mechanical and the uh, digital parts of the products? Uh, and, and that's sometimes called evergreen design. It's a different sensibility, a different approach uh, to the whole problem of design. How do we design products to make it easy to service them remotely? How do we think about that? It's a new design problem. You know, how do we, how do we design products where uh, the pro one product can actually work with other products that are different? And we'll see that a little bit later. Increasingly, products are coming part of, become, becoming part of systems. A farm tractor is becoming part of a smart farm. So all of a sudden, we've got to think about design, not just for the tractor, but also for the other stuff that that tractor might be interfacing with and, and ideally optimizing with over time. How do we embed in our design thinking the security requirements that Jim was just talking about? So the whole R&D and product development and design process is in great flux. And uh, what shape it's going to take and how to optimize uh, is still uh, uncertain. But what's, one thing is clear is it's going to be different. And we're probably going to need some new organizational models to do this. And Jim will talk about that a little later. In terms of manufacturing, we have something very interesting going on. Manufacturing is kind of morphing. Traditionally, manufacturing has been manufacturing a physical thing in a factory, and that has to happen. We're still going to manufacture physical things in factories. But at the same time we have those physical things in factories, we're also going to have to have uh, an infrastructure that actually operates all those products forever. 
when they go out into the field. So manufacturing is, in a way, it's, it's, it's dual. It's, it's the product that we can build physically in the factory, but then it's the product that we run over time. And we can actually modify over time uh, as it's in the field. And, and so how, how do we structure that? How do we think about that? One of the good things that's happening in manufacturing uh, is that the physical complexity of the product is diminishing. Because a lot of the variability uh, can be embedded in the digital components. So, you know, if you have a, 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 a type screen, you know, if you're, you have your iPhone and you want to change it from, you know, uh, Japanese to English, well, there's no physical changes required. You can do that all in the software. So what we're finding is physical complexity is going down. A lot of the variability in products is introduced through the, through the software, through the digital. That means a lot of the sort of finishing of products can happen very late in the production process, even out in the field, uh, which actually simplifies the physical manufacturing. The physical manufacturing is going to be there forever. Uh, and so the whole way we uh, structure and manage manufacturing uh, is going to be evolving. After sales service, I think it's very clear. The conventional service organization is going away. The idea that service is going out and fixing stuff that's broken, uh, and you're not quite sure what was broken, you have to go out and figure out what was broken, those days are over. We have some service that's going to be digital, remote, some service that's continually going to be mechanical, but even the mechanical servicing is going to be totally different. And so the way we organize our service functions, our service departments, the way we think about them, the way uh, we manage them, again, we're going to see a transformation. And that's going to have some organizational implications as well. Uh, marketing, uh, marketing is becoming uh, not the typical, here's the product, please buy it, uh, you buy it, and I'm done. That's not marketing anymore. That's not sales anymore. We're talking about now a different concept of marketing in which we're talking about uh, getting a product to a customer and then thinking about that product as a stream of operation over whatever life that product has. And in the process, that product can be revised and updated and tailored and enhanced and repaired and improved. And, and so we now have to take ownership for this product forever. We can't just sell it and say, oh, we're done. We're responsible for making sure it works. Because this new data is going to allow the customer to understand how well that product is functioning and how many hours a day that product is used and how many minutes of downtime. We have to take responsibility now for that product over its life. And the nature of marketing is episodic. We close the sale model in marketing is gone forever in a smart connected products world. So how do we organize for that? Uh, you know, human resources, as we've done this work, we've come increasingly uh, to the view that human resources may be our biggest constraint in the whole smart connected products. Uh, journey because the, the, the set of new skills here, particularly for a manufacturing company, is uh, completely different. Uh, you know, most manufacturing companies, you know, historically have been full of mechanical engineers. Now, of course, they're becoming software companies as well. We have a fusion of a, of a product company, a manufacturing company, and a software company. They're coming together. By the way, that's even more complicated than just being a software company or just being a product company. It's how to do those things together. Jim mentioned that earlier. But uh, we're going to need people that are systems engineers. We're going to need a lot of data scientists. We're going to need uh, all kinds of skills that there's very few people today that are trained in this system. And this is going to, uh, we believe this uh, shortage of critical skills is going to be uh, probably one of your most uh, interesting and important challenges to overcome. You know, particularly if you're a conventional manufacturing company, you're located, you know, outside of Boston or, or, or the West Coast or, or New York City, you know, how do you attract these people? How do you, how do you get them working together collaboratively with the other types of people in the organization? Uh, this human resource problem, incentive problem, retention problem, we think is going to be uh, one, of, one of the big ones. 
So this is the uh, kind of uh, changing nature of what a company is and what it has to do. And uh, this is quite revolutionary because what companies do for the last 50 years has been pretty similar. I mean, yes, little improvements, you know, now we call it CRM, you know, but we were basically just working with customers. But now all of a sudden the whole process of working with customers looks totally different and so on and so on. So the inside implications of smart connected products are in many ways more profound and harder to deal with than all this wonderful functionality that they can create. Because actually delivering on that is, is going to be a challenge. Now, how does it affect competition? This is something we covered in, in detail in the first article, but, but again, I think the, the point is not only is the inside changing, but the outside is changing. Uh, the way we compete is changing. And that really starts with, you know, the relationship with the customer. And there's mostly good news here because all of a sudden, after sort of an era for the last 10 years, which at least I perceive has been a lot of minor improvements in stuff, you know, in a lot of industries you see incremental improvements. All of a sudden we have an explosion of new functionality and capabilities that we can offer enabled by this new technology, and that, I think, has an opportunity to create differentiation that we haven't had before, to make choices about how our company can really distinguish itself. Uh, it's going to make move competition away from just price cutting, which is what so many industries have become. Uh, uh, now, uh, the customer is going to be a lot better informed about how good our product is now. So that's kind of the counterpoint. Yeah, we can do a lot of cool new things, but the customer's going to know how much uptime, how many hours a day was the product used, how many times did it fail. The customer's going to know all that stuff. So, so, so we're going to have an opportunity for differentiation, but we're going to be held accountable in ways that we've never held, been held accountable before. So the customer relationship is going to be evolving in, in some pretty important ways and the impact on competition. In terms of substitution, what's happening is that smart connected products can subsume more functionality that may then impact other related products. You know, I have this, this little Fitbit here, and uh, there used to be a pedometer business where you could buy a pedometer. But the pedometer business is gone because it's very easy to subsume that function into this device. And we're going to see that in a lot of industries, and, and not just industries like this, but, but industrial industries as well, where products are going to kind of merge together, and, and, and you're going to get, you're going to be the man with no place to sit. You're going to be the, the duck, duck, goose person that doesn't get the seat. Your product is going to be subsumed. So there's a substitution threat here, but of course you can be the one on the offense. You can be the one that's taking your existing product and broadening what it is and how you define it to include new functions that allow you to take business in other, what have been other industries. So that's an opportunity we see here uh, in, in many, many cases. Uh, you know, in terms of rivalry, uh, again, uh, lots of new dimensions of competition and that's good. The worst thing you want to do in competition is you want to compete with your rival on price. Pretty much offer the same thing and just compete on who, who's the cheapest. Uh, this whole smart connected products phenomena is giving us all kinds of new things to compete on. So that's good for rivalry, but we also have to be careful here because in this technology, fixed costs have gone up. To, to get a product out in the field and you've got to not only design the mechanical part of the product, you've got to design all the infrastructure, uh, the digital part, and, and by the time the product gets in the field, the marginal cost is low, but the fixed cost of getting that product out in the field and building the infrastructure is very high. So there's a risk here, we're going to start to see people giving away functionality. It's going to be expensive functionality to build, but we're going to give it away because we're going to get sucked into the idea that, well, it doesn't cost much for this additional product. The marginal cost is low. We'll, we'll give it away to, to build volume, to build an install base. And that argument can be a, a slippery argument. You've got to be careful about that. Um, I think the final thing I, we would cover here very briefly is the notion of barriers to entry. 
at some level, bearish entry are going up. So I would say, my own personal opinion is, we're gonna see consolidation in a lot of industries. Because to play in this game, uh, you know, the bar is higher. Uh, you had to do everything you had to do before as a company, a manufacturing or a product company. You had to do everything you had to do before. Now you gotta do more. It's complicated. Uh, and I think, so I think we're gonna see bearish entry in general going up. The exception of that is, there's a lot of industries where the incumbent, and some of you are incumbents and some of you are new entrants, the incumbent is gonna maybe be a little slow embracing all this stuff. So for, for example, you might have a very profitable service operation in your company. You know, a lot of manufacturing companies make most of their money on service. And that service uh, operation is fed on sending trucks out to fix the product in the field and charging a lot of money for those spare parts. And all of a sudden, what happens if that goes away? Because you can optimize the service function so, so much more dramatically and do a lot of the service remotely. Well, are you gonna cling to your old service model? Or are you going to actually embrace the new service model? Are you gonna cling to your old product concept? Or are you going to be driving uh, uh, the new opportunities for smart connected products, and depending on whether you cling or not, you're going to get disrupted. Um, and so we're going to see the combination of bearish entry going up, but disruption going up. And those two things are going to, for, for the next you know, 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years, those things are going to occur simultaneously. And the question is, what's going to happen in your industry? Uh, how are you going to cope with that? Now, one, one final really interesting thing about competition that's being affected by smart connected products is what are the boundaries of my business? What business am I in? And in general, the answer is that in almost every industry, smart connected products are gonna widen your industry boundaries. You're gonna be in a broader industry definition than you were before. This is an example from you know, farm tractors. You make farm tractors, you're in the farm tractor industry. And then you add smart to the farm tractor, and then you add connected to the farm tractor. But then if you start thinking about it, you can actually connect now and optimize a product system involving not only the tractor, but the tiller and the planter, and, 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 and we can even add to that the irrigation systems and so forth. And all of a sudden, you're not in the farm tractor industry anymore. And the question is, can you compete just as a farm tractor company, or do you have to play in this broader system? Uh, do you have to get into those other products so you can co-design them so that they work as a system better? Uh, these are questions that many companies are having to face. Uh, the boundaries are expanding, and they can expand even more. Uh, what if you think of yourself as a smart farm company? Well, then it's not just the products and the equipment, but then it's a lot of other stuff circling, circling around that that all has to do with optimizing the performance of, of the farm. So industry boundaries are changing, usually broadening, and that kicks off a lot of competitive implications. So all of a sudden, if you look back at the industry structure uh, and the industry boundaries broaden, all of a sudden, the buyer has more choices because they can go with a whole number of different uh, companies making different products and, and use them as the system integrator, not you. You become a commodity, they become the system integrator. Um, you know, we, we see even more opportunities for differentiation. A lot of products will just go away, they'll be subsumed into the product system. Uh, their functionality will be embedded in the product system in another way. Uh, they'll go away. Um, you know, rivalry is now not just about the discrete product, it's about how the product, you know, it, it engages in the system and, and whether its performance is, uh, it allows the system to be optimized, not just the product to be optimized. How do we think about that? Which is going to affect design uh, very profoundly. And, and of course, we have a lot of potential new entrants. So uh, anybody involved in the building control, an air conditioning company, a heating company, a boiler company, an elevator company, all of a sudden there's a potential new entrant into the other guys' businesses. 
Uh, so we think uh, the number of potential entrants in most businesses is going to go up as this systemization and broadening of industry boundaries goes up. So all of these are some big things to think about. Let me turn it over to Jim and, and talk a little bit about sort of what are some of the strategy choices uh, that have to be made. All right, great. Thank you, Michael. So um, I've had an opportunity to work with Michael for, I don't know, 15 plus years now, and uh, I've certainly been schooled in this idea that your competitiveness has two legs to it. On one hand, uh, how good are you at doing what you do, which is operational effectiveness, and on the other hand, how good is your strategic positioning? And uh, the Internet of Things or Smart Connected Products is going to have a pretty big impact on both. You know, clearly on the operational effectiveness, there are dramatic ways to improve service, to improve engineering, to improve sales and marketing, customer support. I mean, there are just big, profound changes. You should do them, and probably your competitors will do similar things. So you need to stay at the frontier of what's possible, sometimes a little ahead, a little ahead perhaps, but in the end, being operationally efficient by itself isn't a strategy. Separate from that, you need to have a strategy to have a unique competitive positioning. And of course, with the smart connected product idea, there are many new ways to innovate, many innovative new business models for delivering your value and so forth. So there are great opportunities to do things differently than your competitors and create for your customers, for the market, a distinct value proposition. But when you head into this new world, you're gonna see there's some tough questions that you have to answer. And uh, we distilled 10 of the ones that I think everybody has to struggle with. There's probably more than 10, but these are 10 that are pretty common. Now let me tell you, I'm gonna have a session later on the executive track, so I'm just gonna hit these at the highest level, and then later I'll drill into them. But the questions are no, uh, they're not simple, they're difficult questions with no right or wrong answer. Things like, uh, what capabilities should you pursue? You know, thinking of cost and value and so forth. Uh, second of all, what should you put in the product? What should you put in the cloud? A third idea is, should you have an open approach or a closed approach? Uh, a fourth question is, there's a lot of technology here. Should you try to develop it yourself or should you try to outsource a lot of it to partners? A fifth question would be, what data to capture? And then number six related to that, how are you going to manage, protect it, and solve the problem of data rights and privacy? The seventh question is, uh, would this affect your distribution of service channels? The fact that you now have this intimate knowledge of your customers, maybe you think of your distributors or dealers a little bit differently. Seventh, or I'm sorry, eighth question is, might you think about a different business model? One that's more focused on outcomes than inputs? You know, more focused on value received by the customer as opposed to assets delivered to the customer? Number nine, you got a lot of information, would you look for ways to monetize it beyond your obvious uh, own use? You might find uh, you know, different business models there. And then finally, number 10, would you think about changing your scope and, and try to expand the industry's uh, boundaries or, or in any case, expand your own com uh, uh, company's you know, product solution boundaries? So these are tough questions, uh, no easy answer. There's some combinations that probably make sense together and some that probably don't, but we see every company kind of thinking these through and weighing the pros and cons, and I'll get into that more um, you know, later in the day here. What I wanted to talk about is the next interesting thing that we found in our uh, process of following the data from Smart Connected Products, and that is that we found that org charts, you know, the organizational structures of companies are changing. They don't look the same. So here's how they typically have looked, and that is we have a CEO and then a series of functions and this might be at a business unit level or, or if it's a smaller company at the entire company level. But where things are uh, benefit from specialization, we've created a functional organization for IT, for product development, for manufacturing, so we can get really good within that specialization. And then we use management techniques, you know, uh, general management, uh, management committees, uh, steering committees, process handoffs, whatever to tie across these functions or sometimes people might even call them silos. Now, once we have this data, there's some important changes that start happening and some patterns that we've seen. So the first thing we've seen is in the area of uh, design collaboration. Uh, excuse me, let me jump over first to data analytics. 
So the first thing is data analytics. We need an organization to analyze this massive amount of data that's coming at us from the products and to tell us what is it saying? What should I do? How can I change outcomes by being involved? And every functional group can never have the expertise to try to do that and repeat that exercise many times, not to mention all the implications around data storage and security and so forth. So a lot of companies are creating a specialized data group. The second big organizational change is around product development. We're talking about a product that's part physical, part digital. It's part client, part server, as I said, part on-premise, part in the cloud. Most engineering groups have never built anything like that before. And they may be masters at mechanical and electrical approaches, and maybe they even figured out embedded software. But there are very few engineering organizations who know how to stand up a cloud infrastructure that's high performance, secure, scalable, usable, etc. That's just a world they've never even been in. Now, IT organizations have this skill, but a lot of people say, IT's never been on a critical product deliverable roadmap before, and I'm not too eager to put them there, because their projects tend to run over and cost and time and so forth. So what are we gonna do? And there's a couple of different approaches we're seeing people try to merge together either a new group or a special group that has capacities from both traditional engineering and from information technology you know, coming from the IT or the, the data center type of organization. Now, when you produce a product that runs part in the cloud, uh, moving on to number three, you, you find an interesting phenomenon, which is you can change the part that's in the cloud pretty easily, but you have to be careful. You know, I don't think Tesla can ever figure out a time when nobody's gonna be driving a Tesla for a weekend so they can upgrade the cloud part of a Tesla automobile. That's not practical. So Tesla and everybody else who has a fleet of products sharing a common cloud has to basically adopt the practice that software SaaS companies have adopted, which is how to get very good at continuous incremental change to the cloud part of the solution. And this requires a new organization because it's part IT, it's part product development, and quite frankly, it's part operations, maybe manufacturing if you want to call it that, because we're actually changing the product that the customer's operating. So this is a new kind of organization that most people really have never seen before, but they're gonna to have to figure it out. And then the last piece is customer success management. And that really goes to the new idea of marketing which is uh, now I have a product I can monitor and I can be proactive and I can make sure the customer's getting good value. And if I use a business model that's subscription oriented, where I'm selling the outcome or the use of the product rather than selling the asset itself, then this becomes absolutely essential. Because products that are sold on a subscription basis sooner or later have to be renewed. And when it comes time to renew them, there's not a huge walkaway cost in a lot of cases for the customer. They say, I'll just cancel the subscription. I don't have a sunk cost, it's easy to walk away. Shame on you that you didn't manage my use of the product a little bit more proactively to ensure I was getting good value and to reach out to see if I needed training or help or proactively solve problems because now I can walk away and, and look at somebody else's uh, solution to product. So anyway, these are like four attachments that need to be somehow figured into an org chart really for the first time, and they're all pretty darn important as companies transition into the world of smart connected products. Now, one thing we've seen people do is to say, I can't really do that all at once and across every business unit and so forth, so maybe what I ought to have is a transitional organization, a center of excellence, to aggregate together the limited talent that I have and try to prove out these approaches, prove out the technology stack, prove out changes to the value chain, prove out you know, changes to the organizational model, and when that all works, maybe three, four, five years down the road, then we'll disband the center of excellence and this will be business as usual, but I need a transitionary organization to get there. Now we've seen a couple of different approaches for such centers of excellence. Uh, one, for example, is to create a dedicated business unit that is the center of excellence, and it has a p &L. That's, for example, what Bosch has done. Another example would be to create a uh, functional center of excellence. It's just a new uh, branch of the org chart that owns this concept, and maybe that's a cost center. 
A third would be a cross-functional steering committee, where it's an organization staffed by membership from all the other organizations trying to make decisions. And then a fourth example, which Caterpillar recently announced, was a partnership. They're gonna partner with a company who's gonna help them work their way through this transition. So these are all interesting models, and I think if I could just summarize it, I'd go back to the quote from Jeff Immelt that I like. Jeff Immelt said, uh, I think it may be in Harvard Business Review, that you go to bed as an industrial company and you wake up as a software company. Because in fact, what's happening is companies are transitioning into a model that's a mixture of the device or thing, smart connected product company and a software company at the same time. And it's a complex, difficult transition that companies really have to go through to be prosperous and, and you know productive and successful on the other side. So anyway, really interesting observations. And with that, Michael, I'll turn it over to you to wrap up. Okay, Jim, well, thank you. Um, I think uh, we, just to kind of pull all this together, um, we believe very strongly that if we look back for the last 10 or 15 years at what's been going on in the economy, not only in America, but in Europe, but in Japan, around the world, it's been a pretty dismal 10 or 15 years. We're not generating very many jobs. The rate of innovation has been slowing down in many respects that we can measure. The rate of investment is slowing down. We're doing a lot of m and But of course, that's not real innovation. That's not real investment. That's just bolting companies together. Um, we, the productivity growth is declining. You know, the, the wave of productivity growth that we got from those first two generations of IT, it really played itself out about a decade or so ago. And without productivity growth, we can't have economic growth. We can't, we can't have job growth. We can't have wage growth. I think what we're seeing here is still early, but it's the beginning of an opportunity to see another surge of economic growth and prosperity in the economy. The productivity benefits of both the functionality of these new products, but also the tremendous efficiency and productivity with which they can be used, what we think is enormous. Uh, one way of thinking about it is that smart connected products are going to allow us to drive a massive amount of waste out of everything. We don't need to fix products before they need to be fixed anymore to follow a schedule. We will know to a second how much that product is used per day, and if we're only using the product a few hours a day, we won't have to have that product and we can share it with another product. Uh, uh, there's, there's going to be an opportunity to, to, this is going to be lean on steroids. We're going to drive waste out of the economy in ways that we've really never seen before. And I, we believe that this is going to give an opportunity for a real surge of growth, a surge of productivity, a surge of innovation. And this is going to be affecting not only manufacturing industries, but it's also already starting to permeate its way into service industries. Uh, you know, the, the kind of service an industry like healthcare offers is being transformed by the products it now has available. So service industries are going to uh, raise the ball. Uh, and even fairly mundane services like building maintenance. We're starting to see building maintenance companies start putting sensors in the bathroom so you can, they can figure out how many people actually use the bathroom. Uh, and if nobody was in that bathroom all day, then they don't need their services. So all of a sudden, we optimize, we improve productivity, we use our resources better. Uh, this is going to be a green revolution as well in terms of utilization of water and natural environmental resources and so forth. So we have an opportunity here for a very bright era. And the question is, how do we capitalize on that? And that leads me to our next speaker, uh, and that's uh, Governor Charlie Baker of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So Charlie, if, wherever you are, if you can come join us, we'd love to have you.